Hi everyone, my name is Ian Wong and I make videos about uh, me learning math. Today I'm going to uh, go through, uh, I'm starting to go through uh, my very first book and I am learning about calculus. Uh, the book that I'm learning from is Calculus Volume 1 uh, by Tom Apostle. This is the second edition, I, I don't know which edition I'm reading through, uh, but at the moment I have picked a random uh, parts of chapter, the, the introductory chapter, and it is um, covering set, the basics of set theory. So today I'd like to uh, summarize some of what I learned and walk through some problems. So I'd like this math journey to be rooted in practical uh, terms, and because of that I will be solving mainly problems and then uh, also uh, by extension talking about theory. The way that I'll format these videos is by first putting uh, the problems and my experience solving those problems at the beginning, and then as I, uh, I'll, I'll create chapters for each of those problems, and for each problem, I will link to uh, the back end of the video where there will be summaries of the, the theory that's behind solving those problems. So if you're unfamiliar, um, you can jump straight to the back, or if you'd like to get into the, the problems and then look up things as you need be, uh, feel free just to continue and uh, just watch through the video. So this is uh, question one. It asks us to use Rossner notation to designate the following sets of real numbers. Uh, so we have some set, we need to write it in Rossner notation, and we need to write out the real numbers, uh, that only the real numbers. Um, or we only need to write a set made of real numbers. Uh, we have a set builder notation and it says like here is like some equation and for all x that satisfy this equation it actually spans this, like makes up this set. Uh, what we need to do then is to uh, figure out which num real numbers actually solve this equation. We can do that through one of two ways. We can use an algorithm like the quadratic equation or we can um, uh, algebraically manipulate the statement to something obvious that says like these are the actual solutions. Uh, let's try the second because it's harder and uh, maybe, uh, well actually no, let's do the first and then we'll do uh, the second uh, so that we can like learn how to properly do the algebra. Um, so if we look up the uh, quadratic equation it looks uh, like here is here is the function that you have um, and the formula is this right here um, So I can do it by hand. I suppose that's good. Uh, we have uh, the x's of the equation equal something. And we know that uh, the formula looks something like this. We have some term, some term. Uh, for the quadri quadratic equation, we, it starts off um, with a b on the top, and then it's uh, I don't know what the the LaTeX is. Let's figure out what the LaTeX plus minus LaTeX uh, PM. Okay, so negative v plus minus uh, the square roots of b squared minus 4ac, looks like that, and then divided by 2a. Uh, 
um, if we replace these characters or with or these symbols with the uh, coefficients of our polynomial, uh, the b, then we can like compute this equation. Um, the the symbols correspond to the coefficients of the polynomial. For us, we have a squared term and a and a constant term, but we don't have the um, a scaled x value. Um, so for us, we only have a and c, and a being uh, one because one times x squared is x squared, and we have a negative one, which is the c term. Uh, so Uh, negative b is zero. Negative zero, uh, and then zero squared, and then four by one, and then negative one and one, like something like that. If we evaluate. This equation we can simplify to uh, what looks like negative four four uh, over two. So we have uh, four over two. Looks like I have a error here. There we go. Square root of four over two. Uh, simplifying further, looks something like uh, square root of four is two, and then uh, plus minus two over two, which we could also just express, oops, uh, as one plus minus one. And it's probably easier just to uh, do this. Um, so I think we have, th these are the solutions or per potentially the solutions to this equation. We can validate that now. Um, and we'll just use paint. Uh, x uh, squared, let, well, like let x equal uh, plus one in this case, right? And then we will use this equation, x squared minus one equals zero. And if we plug in this definition into here, we have one minus one equals zero. So that seems correct. Like this is one solution. Uh, let's do uh, x equals negative one. Um, plugging into the same equation, x squared minus one equals zero. Uh, Again, negative one squared is uh, equal to one. So one minus one equals zero. This also checks. So it's at least a subset of the, the possible solutions. Um, but uh, we know that, I, I, I believe there's a, a law that says the number of solutions to a polynomial it is equal to its order. Um, but, but anyway, uh, it, it, we, we, ha we have the solutions, um, which are given by the quadratic equation. Uh, let's see what the uh, number of solutions to a polynomial equal to the degree. I'm back. My camera cut out. I don't. It, you might notice in the edit, but uh, we will, did the quadratic equation. Uh, we know that there's solutions plus and minus negative one. The question is like, are these all the solutions? Uh, I was trying to figure that out, um, and 
there is a theorem that says the number of solutions to a polynomial equation is equal to the degree n, I think. Uh, the fundamental theorem, the theorem of algebra, and it states that any polynomial of degree n has n rates, but we may need to use complex numbers. Okay, yeah, so because we have a, a polynomial of, of degree 2, power 2, and we found two roots, therefore we have uh, solved for all of the equation, or all of the uh, solutions to that system. Um, it was good that we did the quadratic equation first because now we have the answers and uh, we won't go on a goose chase trying to find the other ones, but we should, I would like to still do the uh, algebraic solution to to this um, statement rather than uh, just rely on the, the algorithm all the time. Uh, so let's do that now because uh, it'll be good practice. We have our set looks like this. And what we want to do is manipulate this some way so that we get the solutions plus one, minus one. Uh, because there's two terms, it will be a binomial. Uh, there'll, there'll be like some sort of binomial expansion. And that binomial, each one of those terms in the binomial expansion will have the solution plus one, and the other will have negative one as the solution. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, you can look at this and say like, hey, this is a perfect square, uh, which is just a recognize or, or just a common pattern that arises from multiplying two binomials, where uh, the binomials, the expansion of that binomials largely cancel out. Uh, like what I'm getting at is that we already kind of know that there are going to be two binomials that look something like this, this, that end up uh, equaling zero. And we know that the solution to one of these is going to be negative one, and the solution to the other is going to be positive one. And uh, we could even arrive at this without doing the, uh, like the quadratic equation. Um, and seeing that, or, or having enough experience knowing this is just a perfect square, where, and the reason why it's called a perfect square, I believe, is because the multiplication of these two terms will generate some terms that cross out and uh, leave you with a squared value uh, and, and some constant. Uh, but let's work towards this solution rather than just uh, knowing that it's a perfect square. Okay. So we have this, uh, maybe if we add some terms, uh, and maybe if we rearrange. So what I'm thinking is we can divide out, what we wanna do is divide out two terms from here and here and then uh, it will, then we make one more div division and, and then it'll yield us the two factors. Uh, so there's this negative in front of here and maybe that's a little hard to deal with. So maybe it's better to write it this way with the positive in front. Um, uh, so let's divide the right two terms uh, into perhaps one mi or multiplied by x minus one. And then let's also divide this by x minus one and see if that works. And uh, x multiplied by x uh, will give us x squared x multiplied by negative one will give us negative x. So that looks like it might work. Uh, 
Ähm looks good, looks good. So now we have this term on the left here and then this term on the right here. And uh, we can see that there's a common factor to both these terms, which is x minus one. And if we factor that out, uh, we will now have, uh, I think the final binomial, x by x plus one. And at this point, we can say, uh, and therefore, uh, A equals, uh, in roster notation, uh, negative one plus one. which uh, corresponds to our quadratic equation. So this one is done. And I will copy this definition here. Uh, the next question is, can we write this set in roster notation again and like what are the solutions? So same kind of exercise uh, as compared to this one where we had to factorize the perfect square, this one already gives us this like the square itself. Um, but yeah, it, so, so plainly looking at this, like we know that uh, x equals one will solve will 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 hold this equation true. Uh, I guess the question is there any other terms where this would be the case? Uh, I don't think so. Um, let's well the it, there there is not. We we can do fancy like we can do some math like we can do some algebraic math or manipulation to simplify this equation, but I think it's actually uh, easier just to literalize what this square means. Uh, it, so like what I mean is, uh, let's take this. Um, what does Ian mean? Uh, so we have this equation and we can do something like uh, this where we would expand, uh, like we would take the, like square root of this, and then take the square root of this. We could we could do this if we really wanted to, um, but it becomes less clear. Like you'll, if if we were to walk through this, it you're gonna only end up with one x, and then at least to me, it's kind of confusing. Uh, what uh, if this is the only solution um, where like positive x is the only solution it's probably easier instead to write uh, to not do something like this and instead oops Uh, do something that looks like it is to instead just like literalize the the square term. It it's overly complicated, or it's like a more compact form, I guess, of representing this, right? And now, like, it's quite easy to see that the there's two binomial terms, and hence, by the fundamental theorem of algebra, we know there's only two solutions. Uh, therefore, these two binomial terms are the only solutions. And uh, both of them are identical, which and one of them is uh, solved by uh, x equals one. Therefore, they're both x equals one. Uh, so if we were to write that, therefore, a or b equals
this is our solution. Um, if we we can like plug this in and check, uh, and that's it's trivially true. One minus one is zero, and zero squared is zero. Okay. Uh, let's go on to uh, the next question. Uh, so this one looks pretty good. I've already done this chapter, but in the future I'll uh, I, I'll be solving them for the first time uh, on on recording. Uh, but let's rewalk through this one. Okay. Um, here's our set. We need to do it on roster again. Uh, kind of boring. I think this will be the last one of this type that we'll do. Um, what I can notice up ahead it, like immediately is that there's on the left hand, there is an x term and a negative 2 term. And on the right side, there's an x term and negative 2 or and what will be a negative two term. Uh, perhaps that serves as a basis for factorization. Um, so let's copy our equation right there. And then let's bring the two to the other side by subtracting uh, two from both sides. Now that we have this, uh, let's factor out the x minus 2 and see if that works. Um, so uh, x minus 2 uh, divided or dividing this by x minus 2 would look like it results in x squared uh, would be the common thing or the common factor. And then doing the second half also yields us this. So x squared by x is x cubed, x squared by negative two is negative two uh, x squared. Um, similarly, x minus two uh, multiplied by one equals that. Now we have x minus two as the um, universal factor and factoring out that universal factor uh, yields us x squared plus one, it looks like. And so there should be three solutions to this equation because of the fundamental theorem of al uh, algebra, x cubed. Uh, we have one of those solutions right here, and then we have a second, which is uh, right here. Um, the This solution could be complex or real, and it's not clear which. Uh, it almost looks like a perfect square, but it's not. Um, because x minus 1 by x plus 1, we know from a previous uh, example, is it has a negative sign in it, right? Like, but uh, whereas our uh, particular equation is plus one. Because of that, it makes me think this is complex. Uh, and if we were to apply the quadratic equation, then perhaps that would uh, give us some insight into if that is necessarily true. Uh, okay. So let's do the quadratic equation. I'll grab that up here. Uh, our a term is one, our b term is negative two, and our, no, 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 that's not correct. 
our, our A term is one, our B term is zero, and our C term is one. So one, one, zero, one. Uh, so this copy here. Zero, zero, one, one, one. Uh, so it will be negative four, or the square root of negative four over two. Uh, which is complex. So we have plus minus square roots of negative four over two. Uh, to check if this actually is true, we could plug this back in, I think, right? So x squared, then this squared turns into negative four over two. No, it's negative four over four, which is negative one. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'll pull a paint just because it's a little bit easier. But we have this term x squared uh, plus one equals zero, right? This is our term right here. And we know that this is a solution plus, we'll, we'll just take one of them, uh, plus uh, square root negative four over two. So we let this equal x, like let, and then we can square this um, negative four over two squared equals um, like this part squared over two squared equals uh, four, negative four, sorry, over four, uh, which equals one. So we know that uh, this, sorry, uh, we know that this is negative one and then negative one plus one is zero, so this holds true, and is our solution. But since this is only asking for the real numbers, uh, uh, this is not part of our roster notation set, therefore, uh, This is uh, in I don't know how to do like um, complex numbers in LaTeX. Let's see in LaTeX. How do you do this? Set math BC, this thing. LaTeX is so confusing. Uh, so this is in C, but we discount it uh, because we only care about real numbers. Cool, 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 cool. Uh, let's go on to a proof-based question. We did quadratic, that's fine, that's boring. Some like things about proving subset relationships, kind of boring. Uh, so there's one question that I haven't done yet, which we'll do at the end, which seems kind of interesting, but 
uh, let's prove the commutative loss. So maybe we'll just do this in paint. Uh, we have some commutative laws, right? Like A union B equals B union A. The, the order uh, or the position of the, of the arguments to the operator don't matter. Uh, where this is position one, this is position two, this is the operator. And whether you do A in position one or A in position two or B in position two or one, it, the result is the same. Uh, meaning like this is visually what it's saying if we do A and this is B, um, that A union B equals B union A. This, if we were to evaluate it, B uh, first and then union A would result in uh, something, would result in this, if this was this side. And then if we were to start with A, and then union B, it'd be the same on the left-hand side. Uh, so how do we prove that? Well, uh, we have our two circles, and this is A, and this is B. Um, we can prove that these two are equivalent by showing that uh, this is a, a subset of this, and this is a uh, subset of, of this. And if they're both sets of one another, that means that each side contains each the, the other side's elements and therefore means that they are they have the same objects elements and are equal uh, to make that kind of argument uh, we can first start on the left side and if we took if we let uh, some set x equal a union B, we can say that if we walk through every uh, element, small x and big x, that each of those elements would also be in uh, B union A. Um, the notation for writing this is for all x and x, uh, x is in B union. Well, actually, we can, we can, simp yeah, B union A, whatever. We'll just do the more verbose form. Therefore, uh, this, and then therefore, uh, the left-hand side X is a subset of uh, B union A. So now that we've proved um, all elements in this equation are in, in this collection here, we just need to likewise prove uh, the other. Um, we can take a slightly different uh, representation than this maybe uh, just for the sake of argument to make because it might e be easier for other to understand for other people um, uh, if we say that if an element is in B uh, union A then then that means uh, the element is either in B or A or both. Therefore, 
that element must also be an A therefore if that or rather if that element is also in a union B then that said element must either be in A or B or both hence an element uh, would hence if an element was in B union A uh, then it could also be said to be in B in uh, A B A union B and that's because uh, these the semantics are, are identical and because of this what we can say is that B uh, union A is a subset of uh, therefore B union A is a subset of uh, A union B uh, and then more largely uh, therefore because uh, the left-hand side and right-hand side are subsets of one another. Uh, they contain each other's element, contain all of each other's elements and uh, can only be equal. And that's our proof. Okay, uh, next, uh, let's do the last problem, I think. And that is uh, one that I haven't solved fully. I kind of like did some random notes here, but uh, yeah, let's see if we can solve this. Lots of notes. Uh, so what is the question? The question is like, we're given, prove that one of the two formulas is always right and one is sometimes wrong. Formula one is this. Formula two is that. Uh, I've gone ahead and proven number two, but let's look at number one. So uh, it's saying, let's take a, a, a visual representation. Like here is A, here is B, here is C. Uh, where this is A, this is B, this is C. And what we're going to do is evaluate both sides and see if this equation holds true. Uh, so this is the left-hand side. Here is the right-hand side. And this being the left hand, this being the right hand. Uh, so starting with this, B minus C uh, will give us this area, B minus C. Right, and then a minus this result uh, will give us something that looks like this. So the left hand evaluates to this resulting set over here. All right. I don't know how to fill in. Is it this thing? This is what. Oh, whoops. This is the, the results that we have. And then on the uh, right-hand side, A minus B uh, gives us A minus B, whoops, brain fart, looks like that. Uh, and then union C, uh, all of this will give us something that looks like this. Oops. Something that looks like that. Uh, and filling that in will look something like this. Uh, you can see that they're not equal. 
uh, and because of that, uh, this illustrates why this um, equation is not always true. Uh, now, this is a visual proof, but it doesn't actually really explain the intuition behind why it's not always true. And uh, we need to arithmetically uh, describe this. Um, so we can do that uh, by constructing like the identical kind of by, by just notating what we just did, or we can uh, use slightly different values that make the, the, arith the arithmetic a little nicer to evaluate. So um, I noticed that uh, there's this union C term here and uh, everything on the left-hand side. So like this always is true. This, the C will always be on the right-hand side, uh, but on the left-hand side, it's only, uh, it's only some subset of A that actually uh, will be on the left hand side um, and to break this equation and make it not actually true uh, I just have to create something in C that's not in A uh, so based on that here is C equals is one uh, letting and there and excluding that from A just letting this be an empty set and an empty set and uh, if I evaluate the left hand side given uh, these parameters uh, I will end up with uh, an empty set on the left hand side, whereas on the right hand side I will uh, it'll be inclusive of the C set, uh, which will be evaluate to one. And, and because of that, it, it doesn't hold true. Let's do let's try and algebraically though manipulate this equation into a form which will give us the intuition behind why this doesn't make sense. Um, we all actually need this so that we can state uh, the additional necessary and sufficient conditions for this formula to be to always be true. Um, so yeah, let's just get ahead of that. Um, I tried to do it here earlier, and I, I messed up uh, what I was doing. So maybe I'll just actually uh, Yeah, maybe I'll do that down here uh, instead of up here. Uh, so we have this equation. Um, in the book, it doesn't actually, the book that I'm reading, the Apostle book, it doesn't talk about how the, what the, the arithmetic definition of uh, a difference operation is, what, what this actually means. Um, but from a little bit of reading and, and uh, some learning that I've done previously. I know that uh, this difference operator is actually equal to uh, the relative complement. Uh, and all that means is uh, you can replace this difference operator by inserting uh, an intersection and then putting a complement around the, uh, the second term. Um, complement again, well, I don't know, just, uh, I'll, I'll link to what a complement means. Uh, so now that we have that, uh, we can further expand. So now that we know that, we can further expand uh, this equation. And what I want to do is just uh, replace all of these uh, difference operators with complements. Uh, now we have uh, another one inside of here, which I will evaluate. Um, and ultimately what we want to do now is to simplify this, or like the goal of this is to simplify it into a representation similar to like how we're solving for roots uh, of a solution that make it obvious under what conditions uh, this equation is satisfied or holds true. I mean, um, so probably this looks, we, we want to get something that looks like this. Uh, let's continue to expand this. Uh, so the complement of 
something is like the complement of like if I have B union C and I take the complement of this, this is equal to a B complement intersection C complement. Uh, and uh, it's similar to De Morgan's law. De Morgan. I don't know if it's actually the same. It's law set complement. I know De Morgan's is related to. Uh, To logic, at least, uh, it looks like it's identical in sets. Yeah, so you you, you essentially just uh, inverse the, or you don't inverse, but you 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 swap the ands for ors or the ors for ands, and then. Uh, the intersections for unions, unions for intersections, uh, depending on where the complement is. OK, uh, so now we know that. Uh, we're going back to our example, let's uh, apply De Morgan's to this. And it will look something like uh, this B complement C So that's the flip. Actually, hold on. Did I do this right? Uh, yeah, that looks right. OK, so now we have this. I, I, was, I was worried that I, uh, like, these, these operators are not associative. Like, I can't just do A minus B before doing B minus C. Uh, because there's these prior uh, parentheses specified. Um, and as I was doing this kind of expansion, I was, wasn't was sure if I accidentally removed some of these parentheses, but it, it seems okay. Uh, so now we have this, and we want to expand it more so that we can simplify it. Ultimately, we want to get a common term between the left and the right side so that we can simplify it further. Uh, this looks as simple as it can get, and the parentheses are already specified. Uh, so we're probably going to aim for something that looks like this. This is still unsimplified. Uh, it can be expanded more. Uh, so let's attack it from the left-hand side to uh, hopefully end up with something that looks like this. This uh, notation is similar to a binomial expansion, uh, except uh, on the left-hand side, instead of there being a bivariate, like, or I don't know if it's called a bivariate, but instead of there being two terms on the left side, like x plus 1, and now there's just one term, which is the a. And we can uh, distribute that. I guess it's not binomial expansion. It's just distribution, uh, distributive expansion of a, of, a, of a single like monomial term. So a by uh, b complement c, and then uh, combine that with a by uh, union c. Um, the intersection is the thing that you combine with the uh, across the distribution. So uh, a cap or a, a intersection B, uh, and then we uh, union that with uh, a, a union C. I think it looks something like this. OK, so now we have two terms on both, si or on both sides that are identical. And that means we can remove them, right? Because uh, these are just additive and identical. Uh, so we can drop the common factor, which looks like this. just dropping this and dropping this. And now what this says is that uh, there's some relationship between A and C. And if we start with the right-hand side first, there's like the C variable. 
or the CSAT. And this, the CSAT is equal to A intersect C. So if we were to draw A somewhere here, um, for example, I don't know, if you draw A that looks something like this, then A intersects C, which is uh, this thing right here, um, equals C. What this means is that the commonalities between A and C always have to be, always have to consist of the entirety of the, of the C set. Uh, what that means is that and, and because of that, that means that, you know, we can take, uh, we can have the A set and we can create a C set, but this C set always has, to, it can always has to be inside of A. It, it can never be outside of A because at this point, the intersection is, uh, is only partial and uh, this this rule or statement will no longer hold true uh, where this is like C and this is A. Um, at, at this point, like A intersects C is no longer equal to C, right? And only if A, and only if uh, C is actually inside, is this true? So I think what we can take away from this is that uh, C always has to be a, a subset or equal to A. Oop, did I get something wrong? Uh, therefore, C is a subset of A. Um, so to try this out, let's try a couple examples. We have our equation right here. And let's say uh, A, like let A equal, so let, let's check that it actually holds true when uh, A or C is a subset of A. So we'll have uh, one, two for A, let B be something simple, uh, like uh, the empty set, and then let C equal one. And then if we evaluate this, uh, A minus B, uh, B minus C, A minus B, uh, union C, then we get uh, one, two minus uh, empty minus one equals uh, one minus empty Uh, union one, uh, one, two equals uh, one, two, union one. Uh, and then like this holds true. So that's good. Like what we wanted matches. Uh, we can try and break this now or like let, let we just tried if uh, C is a subset of a, like a, a proper subset, we can test the quality at this point. Um, so, uh, and replace this for, oh, replace this. Um, so will this hold when A and C are equal? Uh, let's try. Uh, this is an empty set equals uh, this union this. It looks fairly obvious that they're two equal and this is true. So that's good. Uh, let's try where um, A is a subset of C. I mean, you could just do an empty set here. This is probably a little bit easier to evaluate. Uh, empty minus uh, minus one equals uh, 
uh, empty minus empty union one. And then this is just empty and uh, this is one. So when A is a subset of C, this no longer holds. Uh, I'm fairly confident this, well, like uh, arithmetic, uh, algebraically, we've shown this to be true. Uh, empirically, we've seen this to be true across a couple of cases. I will do one last case where A is, uh, or C is a subset of A, but with a non-trivial uh, B in case that affects things. But uh, I think we're done at this point. Um, B minus this minus empty set equals uh, one minus uh, like one, two, three minus sorry, union, an empty set, and then this is uh, an empty set, because like one minus one, two, three is just empty, and uh, empty union empty is this. Uh, like one minus one, two, three is empty, and then empty union empty is empty. Therefore, they're equal, so B uh, doesn't seem to have an impact. Uh, yeah, so I should definitely remove this, which is the same answer. I was guessing that I, I had it when I was working through it previously, I had the wrong arithmetic, but I kind of had this gut feeling that it was C was a subset of A, just solely based on the fact that um, the only way that this additive C would ever match the thing on the left is if C was already inside of A, right? Because the only thing on the left-hand side is basically a sum subset of A. So if C is a subset of A, then this would hold true. Okay, that's the end of the questions. I hope you enjoyed. Hi everybody, thank you for watching. That's the end of the problems and the main part of the video. Um, there's still more if you're interested and uh, in the remaining part of the video, I'll go over set theory and the basics and uh, tell you guys what I know and what I learned. See ya, bye. So starting off with um, sets, like what is a set? A set is just a collection um, uh, of things, typically mathematical objects, but uh, you can think of it like a box or something like that where you put things inside the box and everything inside of the box is the collection. Uh, similarly, uh, like visually you could have a similar kind of idea as a box but instead have a circle and everything inside of the circle is part of that set so in this case we have a triangle which is part of the set and then the circle which is part of the set and the square which is part of the set but um, the like trapezoid is is not part of the set um, in terms of notation uh, this is what a set would look like. Um, you have two parentheses and everything inside of the parentheses uh, is what is inside of that set. So one example of types of, like one type of mathematical object that you could have inside of a set is numbers or natural numbers, like one, one, two, three, four, five, all the way up till you can you stop counting? Um, and this is what uh, a set that contains the first three numbers, natural numbers, looks like. Uh, and then like numbers like four, five, six, seven are not part of this set, only one, two, and three. Uh, typically, rather than just passing around and, 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 and writing out the set itself, it's often easier just to assign it to a variable um, and then use that variable elsewhere uh, in, in, your, in your proofs um, because it's more concise. Uh, the notation 
it, like the the common convention for this kind of like set notation is that uh, it's just uh, Roman uh, characters, like Roman alpha uh, alphabetical characters, like A B C D E F, and they're all capitals. Uh, so we talked about like what is a set. It's a collection of things. Uh, those things typically are mathematical objects. Some examples of mathematical objects are. Numbers, points, uh, curves, games, etc. And we went over some notation about how to write a set, um, which is right here. Uh, the next thing I'm just going to talk about quickly is the how how many things can be in a set. Um, so a set can be empty and look like this, uh, where there's nothing inside of that set. Um, a set, and another way of, of writing this is uh, using the uh, a big O with a with a strike through in it. Um, this just means an empty set or nothing inside of the set. Uh, sets can also be singletons. They have one single object inside of them. They can also uh, have multiple objects inside of them. So like one, two, three. And they can also have infinite number of, of objects inside of them. So there's no end. Um, now, in terms of notation, there's, there's a couple uh, uh, symbols that, are, that I'll, I'll describe to you that uh, are often used um, when talking about sets. One of them is uh, the in symbol. And uh, if you want to say that something is part of a set, you would use this uh, symbol to, to signify that the, the, pre like the, the thing, um, the, the object to the left is, is inside of the set. Um, if you want to say something is not in, um, it would look like this, where there's, again, a strike through. Um, and then if you want to say that multiple items are a part of a set, uh, there is a, uh, a second operator that looks, or a third operator, sorry. It looks like this. Mm. I'm just spelling things wrong, sorry. Uh, so it looks like this. And what this says is that every element or mathematical object inside of uh, the this set on the left can be found in the set on the right, and insofar that extends to a, a quality being that like every element on the left is on the right, and it so happens that there are no other elements on the right that aren't in the left. Um, yeah, so this. Uh, this operator is, is called a, a subset. There is a variant of this, uh, which says that the elements are also on the left, but and the, the elements on the left are on the right side, but they are not equal. Um, and it's just a little more precise. Um, so you can see that the set on the left has two elements, but the set on the right has infinite. And because of uh, the fact that the 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 right side has elements like three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, that they uh, do not contain the same things and therefore are not equal and therefore is uh, like less, is, is only a, is only, uh, a portion of, of the elements that are on the right side. Okay, so we talked about uh, how, what is a set, how many things can be in a set. We talked about common ways of talking uh, or common ways about expressing ideas about a set. Um, the next thing that uh, we can go on to 
is um, operators. So I think uh, Wikipedia probably has some good um, definitions of, uh, of these, but actually one thing prior to talking about operators is just to uh, review other ways about uh, writing sets or, or the notation for sets. Uh, we talked Perhaps before reviewing operators, it's best to comprehensively review the different notations for sets. Uh, we have previously been talking about one, the roster notation, which is uh, comma delimited uh, curly brace prefix and suffix set definitions. But uh, there are actually two other ways of defining sets um, or two, two notations. One is semantic. Uh, the other is a set builder notation. And uh, the semantic definition is equivalent to the first in terms of his ex expressive power, uh, but it just uses common language instead of uh, delimiting the mathematical objects by comma. Um, the, the last option is a little bit more expressive perhaps, or uh, precise and expressive than, than the former two. Um, and this, the idea is, again, to establish a collection of things, but you can do it using uh, mathematical expressions. And so what this is, again, is like a set that uh, starts and ends with the, the braces. But the way that you would read this is that everything to the left of the pipe is the parameters which span the set that make up the set, and everything to the right is the criteria which, which, which sets constraints on the parameters that span the set. So everything on the right side. Uh, so in this instance, we have n, which is the the, the parameter, and it's saying that uh, n all all the different uh, instances of n that can be uh, make up uh, the set, and n can only be an integer and a value between. Uh, 0 and 19. So you would imagine that uh, numbers like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, etc., all the way up to uh, 19 would be inside of this set, uh, m keeping in mind that it's uh, only allowing integers whole numbers. Uh, OK, so those are different ways of notating sets. Uh, Progressing on to uh, operations, there are different ways that we can combine different sets or talk or relate sets to one another. Uh, and these operators express uh, some of some useful ways uh, of of doing that. Uh, we can regard two sets as together, or we, we, we can regard the entirety of two different sets. And uh, so let's say, oh, I should probably just use the old one here. Uh, let's say I have a set like this, and I have another set like this. When I'm talking about the uh, the elements in inside of these sets, I can choose to say that like everything. Uh, I can I can choose to be specific and say that uh, I am talking about everything in uh, set A and set B, where uh, this is A and this is set B, but sometimes it's like. Uh, you don't need the, that degree of specificity. And it might just make more sense to talk about uh, the combination of the two. Um, and uh, in, instead of referring to like set A and set B, we could just refer to uh, this collection, this, this entire collection as uh, set C. So instead, uh, we would be ignorant to the fact that there's actually two 
two sets here. And instead, we would just choose to uh, look at the total combination. Um, to do this, there's an operator, uh, and it's called the union operator. Uh, it looks like this, and you'd say A uh, unioned with B, or A combined with B unioned. Uh, and, and that is how you would notate the, the idea of combining two different sets. Uh, so on, on the right side here is an example of union. And oh, what this says is that, like, in the red, everything, or, like, this first circle on the left side is the A set. The, the second circle on the right here is the B set. And everything that A is unique for that B doesn't, that, that B uh, does not contain will be part of the, the end union. And everything that they share in common, right here, this little oval here, uh, will also uh, be part of the the union and everything that b has and uh, that everything that b is unique for will also be part of the, the final set so these are just like heuristics or little easy ways of interpreting the the semantics of, of these operators uh, the next one that we might consider is like we only want to talk about uh in, instead of talking about uh to like the aggregate of some sets, perhaps we only want to talk about the commonalities of some sets. And so uh, let's say I have another set here and another set of objects here. Um, this is this being A and this being B. And I only want to talk about the things they have in common. Um, the way of expressing this idea is using the intersection uh, operator. And what this just means is uh, taking what is common between the two. Uh, here's an example on the right side. Another useful uh, operator is uh, the difference. Um, and so what we want to do with this is to uh, talk about things that are unique to some set given like relative to like some other sets and uh, we might have uh, our set here and there might be like a bunch of other sets over here and what we want to talk about is everything that set a has that the rest don't so everything here but not in there or there 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 and and the way that you would express this is by referencing the set that you have and then uh, exp um, notating that you want to remove uh, these other sets BC and this is like called the difference or I think there's like there, there's another formulation called uh, the like relative complement I think yeah relative complement and all and and uh, ultimately what they just mean is like the get me the unique parts about this set that I care about. Um, the relative complement is, is, achieves the same thing, but it does it through a technical view of, of the operations that are happening to achieve that, that same result. And it does that by uh, saying like, if I take the complement of, of all these other sets and I remove those, uh, or and I, and I take and I take those complements, uh, and I un and and I consider the commonality between those those complements and, and the the original set. Uh, what will I have in, in the remainder? Um, a complement is all of the things inside of uh, outside of some collection. So if if I take the complement of F, like, sorry, if I just think about F, all the things in F are inside of this circle. And if I take the complement of F, it's everything outside of, of, of that circle or outside that, that are not included in the set. And uh, you would, in applic like if you're, if we're talking about the relative complement or something like that, uh, if we're trying to just describe how the relative complement 
achieves like set difference, um, it would look something like this. You have D and you take all of the elements outside of D. You take C, you take all of the elements outside of uh, C, which are like all over here and here and here. You take all the elements outside of B here, 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 also here. And then what you do is you join those complements with everything that is common across all those complements and A. So we know that everything outside of C, uh, the only thing that it has in common with A is uh, this part right here or whatever. And then we know everything outside of D, the only thing it has in common is uh, this part right here. And then everything outside of B that's common with A is right here. And then if you join all of those together, uh, what's common, you end up with something that looks something like uh, this. And that just ends up being the, the relative difference, taking out each of these objects. It's, it's the exact same. Okay, uh, so that's that. There are some other ideas about how to like uh, take these operators and and make them iterative, or taking these operators and applying them multiple times. Uh, so, for example, if I have like um, set A and I want to union it with set B, and I want to keep on doing that all the way up to set Z, is there like a is there a better way to express this? Um, I won't go into detail about that just because it's it's easy to learn, um, and the notation makes is quite simple. But uh, know that there are more compact ways of writing these ideas. It, that's, but it, it uh, semantically it's the same as just writing it out explicitly. Okay.